text, Betty. I'm reading, I'm reading. Oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death. Set up thine altar here and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion, but of the low, reverend, and honored head, thou canst not turn one heir to thy purposes or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous, and true. The heart's brave, warm, and tender, and a pulse a man's strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds spring, springing from the wound to sow the world like with life immortal. What are we even talking about? No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice, hard dealing, and gripping cares, they have brought him to a rich end truly. He lay in the dark, empty house with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind to me in this or that, and for the memory of kind, uh, one kind word, I will be kind to him. Cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of non rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death and why they were there, so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place, and leaving it I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me, let us go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned. And I would do it if I could, but I have not the power. Spirit, I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there was any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized. Show that person to me, Spirit. I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing. And withdrawn it revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone with an anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, startled at every, startled at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length, the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed. Though he was young, there was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good, she said, or bad to help him? Bad, he answered. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said, amazed, there he is. Nothing is past hope if such miracles happen. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature in her face. 
spoke truth, but she thankful in her soul to hear it. And she said so with clasped hands, but she prayed forgiveness in the next moment and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. What I have drunk what the half drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay. What I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we shall be ready with that money. And even though we were not, it would be bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight with our heart, with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, soften it as they would. Their hearts were lighter. The children's faces hushed and clustered around to hear what they so little understood were brighter and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with a death, said Scrooge. For that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him, though, through several streets familiar to his feet. And as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire, quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were all still statues in one corner, sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed his threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The collar hurts my eyes, she said. The collar? Oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. They were very quiet again. At last she said in a steady, cheerful voice, only faltered once. I have known him walk with I have known him walk with tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, exclaimed another. So had all upon her work. And his father loved him so there was no trouble, no trouble. There's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him. Little Bob, he and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fella. Came, tried, who should help him to it the most. And two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and the speed of Miss Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday, you went today then, Robert, said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. 
I promised him that I would walk there on Sunday. My little, little child, cried Bob. My little child, he broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and he thought a little and composed himself and kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and the mothers working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who meeting him in the street and seeing what he looked like a little, just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what happened to distress him, on which, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you'd ever heard. I'm heartily sorry for it, Miss Cr Cratchit, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what, my dear? Why, that you were a good wife, replied Bob. Everybody knows that, said Peter. Very well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Heartily sorry. He said, for your good wife, if I can be of service to you in any way, he said, give me his card. That's where I live. Pray come to me. Now it wasn't, cried Bob. For the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way that he was quite delightful, and it seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Miss Cratchit. You'd be sure of it, my dear, returned Bob. If you and Saul spoke to him, I shouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Miss Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up himself. Get along with you, retorted Peter, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob. One of these days, though, there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I'm sure we shall. None of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? For this first parting that there was among us. Never, father, cried they all. I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, oh, never, father, they all cried again. I am very happy, said little Bob. I am very happy. Miss Cratchit kissed him, his daughters kissed him, the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter himself shook and himself shook hands, the spirit of Tiny Tim, that child's essence was from God. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom was lying dead. Ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself indeed. The spirit did not say for anything, stay for anything, but went straight on. As to the end just now desired, 
until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, though which we hurry now, is where my piece of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house, let me behold what I shall be in days to come. Spirit stopped the hand and pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it at once again, wondering why and whither he had gone, and accompanied it until he reached an iron gate. He paused, looked round before entering a churchyard. Here then a wretched old man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat, repleted appetite, a worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. Phantom was saying exact was the phantom was exactly as it had been. But he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw near to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if preserved, then they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I the man who lay upon the bed? He cried upon his knees. Finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit. Oh, no, no. The finger was there. Spirit, he cried, tight, clutching his robe. Hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, for, but for this intercourse, why show me this, if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, as he looked down upon the ground and fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change. These shadows that you've showed me by an altered life. The, the kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him, holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed. He saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost.